Hi and welcome. I'm very, very excited today to be hosting Mark Matusik here at the church. And I'd like to thank him for being here and also for Canio's Books for helping host and helping sell books in the back. And that's not a prod, but if you take it as such, it's okay. Um, I'd like to make a brief introduction to Mark before um, he does some reading. And then we'll have a conversation and open it up to questions subsequently. So um, for those of you who need an introduction to him, and I did because his life has been so rich and so varied and so accomplished, um, I had to write it down. Uh, Mark Matusik's father left his family when he was only four, and his mother suffered the huge challenge of raising him and his sister on her own. Mark got a BA in Dramatic Art in 1978 from Berkeley, a fellowship to Oxford in 1979, and a master's in English from UCLA in 1981. That's three years. That's a lot. Um, um, precocity, perhaps. He subsequently moved to New York City, worked at Reuters and Newsweek, and became the interview magazine, Andy Warhol's magazine interview, first senior editor in 1982. After losing many of his friends in the AIDS crisis, he wandered the world, something Emerson would have greatly admired. And um, he spent quite a bit of time in India, particularly of note. Mark went from popular culture at Interview to becoming a serious seeker, writing for the Common Boundary magazine and having essays published in The New Yorker, Oprah, The Utney Reader, AARP, Good Housekeeping, Yoga Journal, McCall's, Harper's Bazaar, The Huffington Post, and Psychology Today, as well as working with Rinpoche on the Tibetan book of Living and Dying. There is a little diversity for you. He became creative director of V-Men. I didn't know about this until I read about it, um, which is the male response to Eve Ensler's organization for ending violence against women. And his autobiographical essay, Rescue, included in a memory, a monologue, a rant, and a prayer book, has been performed internationally. So you can add playwriting to all of the above. He's a writing instructor, a spiritual guide, and always a seeker. I think you're getting a picture of a man with breadth and compassion, but in addition to all of the aforementioned, he has also had an almost lifelong relationship to and fascination with Ralph Waldo Emerson. And we're here to talk about his most recently published work, Lessons from an American Stoic, How Emerson Can Change Your Life. So, Mark. Thank you so much. So it's wonderful to be here. Thank you so it's much. Great it's great to have you. And I had, for some reason, I told Mark that um, earlier this summer, for my book discussion group, someone had recommended reading a book on, just to make this story short, Emerson Thoreau and Henry James, and how they'd all had terrible um, crises of grief in their lives and how they took them and transformed them into creative, self-fulfilling um, behaviors, which is amazing. So I became kind of fascinated, particularly with Emerson, who dug up his dead wife, dug up his dead wife because after she had already been deceased for a while, he just wasn't able to quite process it, and he wanted the physicality of the experience of seeing her corpse. I don't think anybody would do that now. <laughs> On the other hand, I mean, just to go back to his absolute um, affirmation of nature and the corporal and what spirituality uniquely is to him, that really <laughs> caught my attention, to say the least but also made me rethink how I'd always perceived him. I always just thought of him as nature boy and Thoreau too. And this was the beginning of a, a new kind of interest that I had in Emerson. But your book has made a huge difference. So, and you were going to read from it? Would you like to add anything else 
Bio autobiographical to what I'd said? If oh, I no, that's something? plenty of biography. Thank you. <laughs> There's more, believe me. That yeah. wasn't the abridged version. I'm just going to read from the preface of the book and give you a sense of why I did it, who I am, how Emerson came to be so important to me, and then we're going to have a wonderful conversation. I first fell in love with Ralph Waldo Emerson at a crisis point in my own life. I was a heartsick 22-year-old graduate student, floundering in academia, panicky about my future, overwhelmed by self-doubt, and terrified I would never discover who I was really or why I'd been put on this baffling planet. I'd struggled with confusion since childhood. Everywhere I turned, duplicity and hypocrisy were obvious to me as a boy. Nothing and no one were quite what they appeared to be. The grown-ups juggled alternating masks in different surroundings, and I was a two-faced deceiver myself, concealing who I really was, an angry, fatherless, damaged boy, under a shield of Teflon bravado. I acted the part of an all-American overachiever with a promising future ahead of him, while inwardly I was a miserable train wreck, cynical, paranoid, lonely, and lost. I told myself that an advanced degree would help to boost my drooping self-esteem, but that was a fantasy. When that fall semester started, I was as frustrated, angry, and self-punishing as I had ever been in my life, suffocating in academia, bereft of inspiration, holding my breath, hoping for something important to happen, to make things matter, to give me a purpose. Yet what that elusive thing was exactly, I could not say. I was also chronically out of cash, which is what led me to apply for a research assistance job working for a visiting professor from Yale named Barbara Packer. Professor Packer needed a flunky to do the grunt work on a manuscript she was late in delivering, a study of Ralph Waldo Emerson's major essays. My job was to hunt down out-of-print reference books, excavate ancient newspaper clips, and transcribe notes from blurry microfiche onto multicolored 3 by 5 index cards. I knew very little about Emerson at the time. I'd read snippets of his extravagant prose in high school, but mostly remembered him as the avuncular mentor to the younger, hipper, more tragic Henry David Thoreau, whose Walden had wowed many of us in senior English. Professor Packer kept me on my toes that year, pouring through the library stacks, lugging books home to comparative textual references. And by the time that spring semester rolled around, I'd managed to receive, with no forethought on my part, a fairly good introduction to the life and works of this, of this extraordinary man. Meeting Emerson changed my life. His big ideas challenged my puny worldview and exposed me to a vision of human potential I had never known existed. His insights were radical and paradigm shifting. Human life has a spiritual purpose to recognize our true nature, evolve from ignorance to self-knowledge. We are each endowed with unique purpose and genius, and our mandate is to unfold our character as passionately, originally, and bravely as possible. Emerson taught that pain, loss, suffering, and conflict are teachers and guides in disguise, crucial for our awakening, and that nonconformity, inconsistency, introversion, stubbornness, quirkiness, and a little wickedness are beneficial virtues for self-realization. Following the crowd is a mistake, and changing your mind is a very good thing. These were eye-opening insights for me, opposed to everything I had been taught. The idea that we are spiritual beings first, personalities second, that no real separation exists between human life and God, cast a sacred light on existence that I had never known before. In the secular America where I'd grown up, God was off limits as a serious topic. I had no faith in a divine creator, was opposed to most organized religions, and considered myself a firm agnostic. Yet, when Emerson counseled, you look within not to find yourself but to find God, I had a sense of what he meant, though the terminology was arcane and loaded. When he described the one mind, the divine intelligence, running like an electric cord through creation, he spoke deeply to my unarticulated experience. He taught that nature is God made visible in the world, that we see God through the mirror of nature, in other words, and that we are reflected in the creation. He explained that genius is the, is the light of divine intelligence within us and that we are inseparable from this power source, that happiness results from obeying its guidance, trusting our own choices, resisting the urge to imitate, knowing ourselves as outcroppings of the natural world and therefore of God, 
joined in a kind of cosmic fandango with all of existence. The more Emerson I read, the more alive I felt. I began to make overdue decisions. I left graduate school, made amends with my family, broke off a bad relationship, moved to New York City, started finding work as a freelance journalist, and stopped blaming the world for my problems. My addiction to taking offense over tiny social transgressions finally lost its allure. Emerson said, never fall into the vulgar mistake of dreaming that you are persecuted when you are contradicted. <laughs> I could hear him speaking to me. I focused on looking inside for the source of my troubles, examining my angle of vision, the stories I told myself about myself and the world, who I took myself to be, what things signified, the details that mattered, and those that did not. Emerson emphasized that your angle of vision creates your world, an insight he shared with the ancient Stoics, and that genuine freedom rests in the power to choose how we wish to respond to life's conditions. Knowing that perspective shapes reality, we're better able to interrupt our knee-jerk reactions and respond to challenges more skillfully, constructively, mindfully. Except in cases of rare affliction under physical torture or sickness, for example, a person always has the power to choose her responses and to decide when, how, and by whom she allows herself to be hurt. It was glaringly obvious that the majority of my problems were self-created and arose from how I was choosing to look at situations, not from the circumstances themselves. I learned that Emerson, I learned from Emerson that, em, that I learned from Emerson that it is the tendency to cling to false beliefs and confuse our narratives for reality that gives rise to most of our suffering. Self-hating, dishonest, twisted stories diminish our lives and prevent us from knowing who we are. Robbed of self-knowledge, we lose our direction. Quote, if one does not know to which port one is sailing, no wind is favorable, Seneca reminds us. A firm grasp on your compass is necessary to reach the desired shore. My own lifeboat capsized again two years after I arrived in New York. I received a fatal diagnosis that promised me no more than five years to live. With mortality in my face, all bets were off. I quit my vapid magazine job, sold my belongings, gave up the lease on my apartment, said goodbye to my friends, and traveled with a friend to India in hopes of finding a spiritual path that would help me survive my mortal terror. I hopped around from monasteries to ashrams to healing workshops, overwhelmed with questions, seeking spiritual strength, clawing my way through an encroaching darkness. My shredded copy of the portable Emerson was always with me. If I was having a particularly gruesome day, a well-spent hour with Emerson could pull me off the ledge, remind me of possibility, settle my nerves, shift my perspective, and loosen the noose of self-pity that I was struggling to keep from around my neck. By, mid by the mid-1990s, strangely enough, I was still around and reasonably healthy. And when treatments for my condition finally appeared, I was given a second lease on life, surreal and surprising in the extreme. Aristotle compared good luck to the moment on the battlefield when the arrow hits the guy next to you. It's an abstract, outer space, torn in half emotion, partly shattering, partly sublime. Awe is the only word that fits. This torn in half feeling of tenuous survival is akin to how many are feeling today. As the world has become more unhinged, a collective sense of outrage and disbelief has settled over citizens in countries around the world, a kind of pre-traumatic shock paranoia, exhaustion, mistrust, and dread of the next heart-stopping news. There's a dire need for spiritual direction, justice-seeking, restitution, truth-telling, and repairing of the social fabric. Fortunately, alongside this collective trauma is a growing interest in our own potential, an urgent pull toward awakening, a fierce determination to learn from calamity, question our values, reshape our choices, optimize our potential, and cherish our lives, knowing how quickly they can be threatened or taken from us completely. The pandemic has bequeathed, has bequeathed us, along with some terrible things, a sudden planetary awareness of our shared impermanence and fragility. This global collision with mortality has given rise to a proportionate upsurge of public interest in self-examination, authenticity, identity, purpose, and what it means to be a fully human being. Not since the consciousness revolution of the 1960s have we witnessed such a nation's wide display of soul searching and spiritual hunger as we see now. That's my purpose for writing this book. 
Emerson's transformational wisdom is exactly the medicine we need today. His teaching shows, that there is, shows us that there is a way through, even when all can seem lost, a humanistic path to self-knowledge that combines the pragmatic, unsentimental strength of the Stoics with the majesty, beauty, and freedom of transcendental philosophy. Having used these lessons for 40 years, I can attest to their power and usefulness and their profound relevance to the problems that we face as contemporary people. Emerson will teach you, if you let him, to break down the walls of perceived limitations, move beyond the confines of self-absorbed ego, and attain a vision of your life that is infinitely larger, deeper, and richer than anything you believed possible. As he said, the health of the eye demands a horizon. We are never tired so long as we can see far enough. May this book be a help meet in seeing farther, standing taller, listening more closely, loving more deeply, and savoring without apology or reservation the preciousness of your life. Emerson is the teacher we need today. It is high time we reclaimed our national treasure. I think that's one of the best introductions ever. I was really quite blown away when I read it. Like, I, I was like, where's Emerson? <laughs> I'm with all of those people whom you describe so beautifully, and I think it's also a great summation of what's going on in the world and the anxiety that we're all sharing on a mass level. Very much our own fault, but let's not be victims, let's be doers and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, as Emerson would, I think, say. I, you know, I also want to thank you throughout this book for using the she, her pronouns. Um, of course, the head of V-Man, <laughs> yay. <laughs> um, it's, it's very refreshing. I, it, occasionally, it caught me by surprise, and I was like, oh yeah, he's doing this deliberately. And other times, I just flowed with it, and I thought, I'm still learning to do this, because I'm old enough that that's new-ish. Um, and I think it's very important. I have to just say that last week, I got a nasty note from somebody in Brazil who was reading the book, who lectured me on the fact that the male pronoun has been respected for 500 years in the English language, and that we really need to stick with it. That, yep. And he was, he, was, he was criticizing my publisher, you know, saying, you need to tell your publisher that this is not, this is not right. Well, so, that's, yeah. he's The going patriarchy to, is alive and well. <laughs> he's going to have to read an extra chapter of Emerson to make up for that. Um, and also, thank you for sharing the story of your illness in your book. I think that it's, you present yourself with such vulnerability at the beginning in the preface that I think that it's a, an extraordinary invitation to the public to, to dive in to something that obviously is going to challenge people on so many significant levels, spiritual, physical, et cetera, et cetera. I think it's very important that that, that corporal aspect isn't, isn't lost. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your interest in Stoics and Stoicism and Marcus Aurelius? And because I don't, I mean, I don't, I haven't read Marcus Aurelius, mm. to my great shame. Mm. But um, it's very interesting that you consider Emerson, particularly an American Stoic. I know superficially enough about it to understand why you would say that, mm. but can you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. Well, Stoicism originated in ancient Rome. Uh, and Marcus Aurelius was one of the great proponents of, of Stoicism. And it's a philosophy that speaks to hard times. The worse things are in the world, the stronger Stoicism becomes. Uh, it's a very sturdy rope. It's actually connected to uh, cognitive behavioral therapy most closely. It's closer to that than it is to what you would think of as mysticism, for example. So it has, so it has like a fundamental practicality. It's f absolutely practical. And the purpose of Stoicism is to decrease negative emotions. Mm -hmm. And so using, uh, using different what they call spiritual practices, you know, we can change our expectations of how much we're supposed to be able to control. Uh, and understanding the limitations of control, the Stoics are always saying, is a way of is a way of not uh, having expectations of yourself that are unrealistic and suffering because of them. So understanding that they could they talk about amor fati, which is love, learning to love the life that you have, mm -hmm. and that's something I think most of us, a lot of us, can 
can benefit from. Uh, understanding that life always has limitations, that there are things we can change, most things that we can't, and that living within the possible is actually where well-being happens and, and, where, and where, where wisdom exists. And understanding limits and understanding the possible because of limits. And yet, there is so much about Emerson that's about awe and expansive revelation that it's, it's just an interesting thing that there that he's suffused with stoicism and also with this kind of, I, I remember um, reading something that you wrote about transcendentalist as a way that he probably would not prefer to be described, mm -hmm. but that there is clearly some measure of that kind of awe in. He had both. Yeah, no, he had both. And really, his, Emerson's philosophy is a combination of three streams. He was raised, he was a seventh generation minister. So there was a strong Christianity. He never lost his love of Christ. But he had the gall to say that Christ wasn't a god, that he was a great teacher like Buddha. To a bunch of divinity students, did he not? What was, yeah. what was that part in your book that, yeah. Yeah, that he, he kind of tells off of, kind of like the graduating class of Harvard or something? Yeah, it's, well, it's, oh, it's by a, the way. <laughs> it's his famous Harvard Divinity School address. And he was invited to address these boys. I think it was probably 10 you know, boy, 14 to 15 year old boys. And he said to them, you're wasting your time with your books. Go out into the woods, commune with nature. You don't need, you know, to wish, intuition is more important than tuition. And can you can imagine what these bo little boys must have thought? Anyway, he was, he was banned from Harvard for 30 years <laughs> after that. And because this was blasphemy. This was absolute blasphemy. He was called a pagan. He was called a, a pantheist, which was a terrible thing to be and he was persona non grata. Uh, he actually embraced the transcendental uh, label, but he did. Yeah, he didn't mind being called a transcendentalist. He was really one of the founders of transcendentalism, mm -hmm. but he didn't like the, uh, the selfishness that goes along with a lot of so the navel-gazing approach to spirituality. It's all about connectivity. Are you referencing inaction and, and self-absorption versus social engagement and, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he, yes. Okay, yeah. I have, I have, I have so many questions just from reading the book. And also, you all have to know that this book is actually kind of a how-to guide which is rather remarkable. It's divided into nine million chapters. How many chapters do we have? I can't remember. <laughs> Twelve. <laughs> Twelve chapters, and they're all very dense. I didn't quite finish it. I'm just like a fraction from the end. But I found myself just unable to resist savoring each chapter and trying to learn from it. I felt like I was being offered this incredible opportunity to to grow and change my life with each, with each um, aspect mm -hmm. that you're trying to draw up. How did you delineate your chapters? Did you follow? Some, did you follow Emerson's writing and your well-worn? Um, no. No, I, I, I didn't. I've been working with these lessons for so many years that it, they've distilled into kind of twelve pillars for me of. Of wisdom, there could have been fifteen, or there could have been ten, but these were the twelve that I, I chose, uh, and I wanted it to be a kind of map to authentic living, using these principles, which are timeless principles, uh, for contemporary life. So it seemed to you obvious that, that this would be the breakdown. That to me is fascinating too, and you've and you've led many, many, many workshops for people on spirituality and growth and psychology and. Etc. But and then, but you also studied Indian philosophy, Chinese philosophy. I mean, you have a huge, huge breadth of um, knowledge. And how? Why? Why Emerson now? I'm just curious. Is it because of the crisis that we find ourselves in as a society and as a world? Did Did you start thinking Emerson is the only way that we can all cope with this? Books have a mysterious way of coming into being. Anyone who's a writer here knows that. You can have a germ of an idea and think, I'm going to do this now. It's the right time. And you sit down to do it, and, 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 and nothing comes out. You know, that you just, it's not the right moment. 
And so for me, I kept waiting. I wanted to write about Emerson for many, many years, and it was just not the right time. I was either doing something else, or I didn't feel quite right, or I didn't, know the, I didn't feel quite ready, or I didn't know the approach. Uh, and then about three and a half years ago, I knew. And, and the world also, you know, the pandemic was happening, people were in crisis and talking about existential questions all the time. That became the, the sort of the coin of the realm was to talk about what does it all mean and what's my purpose and do I need to change my life? And people were ready. It felt like people were right for this kind of a book. There's a, there's a great, probably most of you know, there's a great Rilke poem that's um, no ode on a bust of Apollo, by, I'm sorry, I can't do the exact title of the poem, I'm so embarrassed. Poets in the audience, speak up. <laughs> but um, it, it ends with, you must change your life. Right. That is the last line of the poem. And I remember the first time I read it, probably in high school, I just about fell over. I was like, what, how this, what, is, what, is, he, what is he saying? It, it, was, it seemed almost violent because the rest of the poem is much more dreamy and speculative and poetic. Mm -hmm. And then this emphatic order, you must change your life. And I've carried that around with me. And I too was very struck by the tone of your book because during the pandemic, I kept thinking about that line because it just, it's always stayed with me even though it's just a poem. But that one line has just been like, it's like a, prod and I'm I fear change anyone that knows me knows that I fear change but I do just with reluctance and it's it's an inspiring I think it's very very inspiring that you've tackled this hmm. well because pe this is the dialogue now I don't know anyone who isn't talking about the end of the world yeah and who isn't talking about you know what 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 happens when the the the, the bottom falls out again you know, people are living in this hyper vigilant, with this hyper vigilant sense of impending doom. And that's not a comfortable place to be, but it's a great place uh, on the spiritual path. Mm -hmm. Because it's f it forces us to ask questions that it's so all too easy to bury in the, uh, in the run of our everyday lives. Well, and, and I have to, s if, you had a, if you had the diagnosis of a fatal illness with a five year limit yeah. for the rest of your life, I mean, I. I can't even imagine enduring that. It just seems so utterly terrifying. But you weren't paralyzed. You traveled, you sought, you learned. So you have a leg up on us, <laughs> us, I think. With that. But we're all in the same we're all in the same condition. The thing that people you know, those of us who have had a diagnosis, let's say, or lost a country or lost a family or wh whatever it happens to be. Are, are just waking up to something that's true for all of us. Mm -hmm. And so I feel very fortunate that I had that wake-up call at a young age because it really changed the way I look at my life. Mm -hmm. You know, Dostoevsky talks about, he, he had had a close call with death himself, the Russian novelist, uh, and he said, the only thing that I fear is not to be worthy of my sufferings. And what he was saying is that we need to be aware that pain, suffering, loss uh, have a purpose. And the purpose is to remind us of what can't be taken away. That's what pushes us toward the spiritual, toward the metaphysical, toward the numinous, is coming up against impermanence. Everywhere we turn, we say, well, gosh, everything else, everything is, is falling away but one thing. I worked with Ram Dass before he died on one of his last books. And he said to me, everything else diminishes but one thing, wisdom. He said, wisdom is the only thing that can increase as you get older, while everything else falls apart, wisdom alone remains and actually gets richer and deeper uh, and more, more effective. And that, that, that um, touched me. It's you know. seriously comforting. It's true. Think, it yeah. is also true. Yeah. Because in, the mo in, in extremis, what else do you have to hold on to mm -hmm. but the wisdom that you've gained? Well, I'm, I'm also interested in you, in you speaking so directly about God, just the idea of God because I'm a, I'm a very lapsed Catholic, and I have an aversion to nuns and priests, and you know the structure of organized religion scares me. I had, I had some, not abusive, but you know, like unpleasant would be a, a very polite way of saying, 
priests and nun interactions, you know, nuns with rulers that would hit children with them and priests that would hear your confession and try to browbeat you into some sort of extraordinary guilt thing for like nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, like I forgot to do something. Well, then say 500 Hail Marys, whatever. So, but, but you seem to have a very particular relationship with God and I've noticed, just to be very um, honest with everybody, that over the last few years, because I've had some weird shit happen in my life, unexpected, strange things and, and tensions that, like we all have, I've, I've taken to thinking, maybe I can pray. Maybe I can pray now. Maybe that would help. And just trying a few <laughs> lines of this or that or making something up. Mm -hmm. But can you talk more about how you evolved into someone that's comfortable with... God as a concept, and if you can talk more about, I get the thing about you look at nature and you see God, mm -hmm. and it's a spiritual comfort because you sense a, connect, a connection and a deep connectedness. Mm -hmm. That is God, I can buy that really easily, but I'm wondering about if, if it has a kind of a personalized, if God has a personalized quality for you. Completely personal uh, and transpersonal. I mean, I grew up in a family where God was never talked about. We, was, we were fallen Jews. You know, we sort of worshipped at the mall. You know, we had no interest whatsoever in supernatural. And I went through most of my life, I'd say until I was about 40, saying that I was an atheist, you know, that I was agnostic slash atheist. And then I realized that it was a semantic problem. It wasn't that I didn't believe in God. I just don't like the word God because of the associations and the baggage and the patriarchal uh, piece. But I absolutely believe in a divine intelligence. I absolutely have a sense of there being one mind of which we're all a part. You know, I have no doubt that there's an invisible, that there are invisible realms and invisible worlds. I don't mean that woo, I mean even just as quantum mechanics is telling us, mm -hmm. that there are all many, many dimensions that we don't perceive. So I'm not an atheist at all. I just don't, I just don't like the word God. Uh, and sometimes it can, be a, it can be a stumbling block when people read Emerson, for example, people who aren't given to religion, who are really turned off by it. So I just invite you to replace the word nature with God. That's all you have to do. Uh, it's the same thing. So for me, it's very personal in the sense that I feel, as Emerson did, that this power is within me, the same power that's within you, and it's what connects us. And then is nature for you the world outside yourself? No, I'm nature. You're nature. Of course, so we're all nature. So there's nothing inseparable. There's nothing, there's no separation. There's no separation, period. No, there's no separation. And that's why spending time in nature is so important. It reminds you that you are nature. The idea that there's nature and you, how ridiculous is that? <laughs> so what happened? I mean, were we just sort of dropped here like Venus on the half shell? I mean, it's, no, no, we grow out of nature. We're upcroppings of nature. Mm -hmm. there's, no, there's no difference, there's no separation. So when I, get, when I got that, I I'd sort of lost my antipathy and aversion for the, the word God. And I, understood, I understand with Emerson that that was his, loca that was his vocabulary, that was his terminology. Um, there's other, I mean, besides that, which is a big part of this book for me, um, I'm also really interested in, um, there's a part in the book where you talk about living with ambiguity, to go back to what you're just saying. Um, you say gratitude is the antidote to self-pity. Can you talk about that a little bit more? I get the, you know, to have creation, you must have destruction, you know, Kali kind of thing, but can you talk a little bit more about gratitude? Because gratitude is bandied about so much these yeah, days. Yeah, absolutely. And this is something I learned in my own life, was, was that in, in, in when I was at the edge, when I thought I was checking out, and it was sometimes really hard to find any light, um, if, I were, if I found myself feeling thankful for anything, it could be the love of my sister, it could be the beauty of the day, it could be my dog, whatever it happened to be. I couldn't feel sorry for myself at the same time, that they were antithetical. And I realized just on the job that uh, gratitude is the antidote to self-pity. So in that moment when you uh, 
uh, feel self-absorbed, when you feel the world getting smaller, when you start to give up hope, if you turn your gaze and you expand what Emerson calls your angle of vision to take in someone else, for example, yeah. that self-pity self -pity dissipates. Mm -hmm. uh, and and people, you're right, people bandy the word gratitude around all the time, and it can sound very saccharine, and being great, you, know, you should be grateful for whatever happens. It's not like that. The kind of spiritual gratitude Emerson talks about and that I think about uh, is gratitude for the opportunity to be alive, full stop. That's it. The ability to be here today, that's enough. Everything else is gravy. And when you get that, it really shifts your expectation level. I'm not saying I don't still get caught up in, in stuff, but the ground, at the ground level I'm just grateful to be alive. Mm -hmm. And that, that happens when you, come, when you come close to losing your, your, your life. Yeah, every day above ground is a good day, yeah. as a friend of mine says. Yeah. Um, I would like to talk to you a little bit on a more mundane level too about you, towards the beginning, one of the earlier chapters, you talk about social media. You don't like it. And, I get it, but I'm just, I would just like for you to talk a little bit about that because you, you say that several, in several different ways and at several different times, how injurious it is to culture. And I assume that you mean by that connectedness and sharing of the actual sharing of actual wisdom and, and the things that are important in culture, not just culture, culture. No, I think social media has many positive uh, ben has many benefits, and there are you know positive uses for social media. But it keeps us looking outside of ourselves mm -hmm. for recognition, for approval, for likes, for strokes, for winks. You know, if we're constantly focused on what Emerson called the exterior life, uh, then we lose the guidance within, the still small voice within us that knows a lot more than you're going to learn. On, uh, on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram today. Mm -hmm. So it's not, a, it's not an either or thing. Obviously social media is with us to stay. Uh, it's not to be, you know, to be sort of reactionary about it, but to understand its limitations. Thoreau has a great quote somewhere, and I won't get this right, but he says that some, somebody who is waiting at the, goes to the post office, uh, post office every day waiting for mail, which is similar to going on Facebook or going to your email, he said, hasn't heard from himself in a long time. <laughs> um, can I just read one part of your book that yeah, just really sure. hit me? Um, Frederick Buchner, am I pronouncing yeah. that properly? B-U-E-C-H-N-E-R, Buchner. Quote, life is complicated enough as it is, after all, through some moment of beauty of pain, some sudden turning in our lives, we catch glimmers at least of what the saints are blinded by. Only then, unlike the saints, we tend to go on as though nothing has happened. He goes on to say, this is from your book, he goes on to say that to go on as if something has happened is to enter the dimension of life that religion is a word for. I think that's so interesting. Waldo's overarching message is to quote you directly, live your life as if something has happened. I think that's just a fascinating, I did like such a full stop when I read that, that I had to write it down mm -hmm. and share it because I was, it's not the same as you must change your life, but it's like you must see your life. Mm -hmm. Like you must, act, you must actually take it in. And I think it's so powerful. Um, would you like to? expand on that since? Including the mystery, and that's something that we, we lose sight of. We lose sight of how extraordinarily mysterious this experience is. You know, we take so much for granted. And in those moments that Buchner's talking about, when we have an, a sudden opening to something that's bigger, uh, most of us just go on as if some, nothing has happened. But to go on as if something has happened, and to, tr and to bring that awareness of the transcendent uh, of what you might call the religious, the spiritual, the, the transpersonal into our everyday life is the purpose of being a human being. So when Emerson talks about the unfolding of his nature being the, the reason for a person's life, that's what he means. The unfolding of our nature, not only the nature of the body, but the nature of the spirit. Uh, and we don't pay much attention to the nature of the spirit uh, in this culture. 
Yeah, I think, I think that we're so overwhelmed with things that are trying to be extraordinarily entertaining or there's some weird, you know, like if somebody falls when the light hits it and it's that magic lit up thing. I mean, we have all these things to entertain shock and, yeah. for shock and awe of ourselves, but then it's such a flood that we can't stop. It's hard to really, really take them in and realize that something has happened. And an epiphanic um, moment in someone's life is just one of the most precious things I can think of. I can't think of anything that's more amazing than that mm -hmm. and more reaffirming. And yet, at the, at the moment I think of an epiphany, your, your feeling is to be outside of yourself because you're so connected, you're not just you. Like, it's so expansive. But I think it's, I think even for me, like occasionally, especially during the pandemic, I would see something that would be moving and there was already so much emotion and so much fear and so much anxiety. I'd almost want to run too fast from it. Like, I wouldn't sit there and like really take it in. And I, I mean, I would say too that, you know, strong emotions, love for people, like the kinds of almost painful feelings that you have, and then the fear of losing them or the person that you love. I mean, all of those things are things that you kind of tend to roll over. So I highly recommend this book because I think it, <laughs> I think it slows, I think it's there to slow us down. I think it's there to slow us down in a profound kind of way that's really could be very healing. Mm. And, um, well, that's one thing, excuse me, about wonder and awe and epiphanic moments is that time seems to stop. That's why we call them timeless moments. That's why we remember those moments of awe so profoundly and they imprint themselves on us and stick with us for the rest of our lives. You know, you can remember the moment when your child was born that's that, or that moment when your parent died or the, the time that you, you became aware of some, some miraculous small thing. The mind slows down. It's, the mind s seems to stop. And that's the real value of them. And so I hope the book does slow people down enough to start to pay attention. Well, we, I mean, we were in such a rich world. I think there's tons and tons of little wonderful epiphanic moments, too, that still, you know, like you just, you just sort of gobble them like chocolates or something rather than taking them in. Every moment is that, though. <laughs> I mean, every moment really is that. We never in all of creation will we have another moment like this one with this group of people in this spot and you and I sitting here uh, and the stars as they are tonight. This is a precious moment. We take everything for granted. We forget that this is absolutely unique. And if we lived in that state of awareness, that's, which is the state that the sages and the saints live in, we would be transported all the time by how extraordinary it is to be alive. Just the unlikeliness, the unlikelihood of our being alive <laughs> in this world, doing what we're doing, that we came through this pandemic, that there's all this danger and we can still feel joy. Mm -hmm. That's extraordinary. And to live with that, that's what I mean by gratitude. <laughs> it's not this kind of Pollyanna, you know, it's all just great, you know. That's yeah. not what it is. Um, can you tell me who said the earth laughs in flowers? That heads up one of your chapters. I assume that's an Emerson quote, but I'm just wondering. It is. Yeah, that's Emerson. The, earth, that's the earth laughs in flowers. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. Um, I mean, I know that it's in relation to awe and wonder, but there's, there's some humor in that, which I really think is... Adorable. Did he have a good sense of humor? He did. Apparently, he could be very silly. And one of his great quotes, I won't. He said basically, if you don't roll around a lot, and if you don't, if you forget to roll on the floor, and then you're wasting your life. You know, he, he <laughs> says, says something. Says them not. So he, he could actually be very, very silly with his, with his friends. Yeah. Thanks. Um, would you like to add anything before we open it up to the audience? No. Okay. Anyone like to? Oh, can I ask a question? Oh, sorry, Amon, do you want to ask a question? No, you go first. I insist. Hi, thanks. This is a really interesting conversation. And um, you talked about social media um, 
And I'm just curious, because I've thought a lot about this. I have a 15-year-old daughter who is obviously incredibly engaged in social media, but also technology. And I've thought about technology as sort of um, a, a kind of natural extension of us, of nature. And I'm just curious what you think or what you think Emerson would sort of how, I don't know, he would kind of view technology within the realm of you know, people versus technology, or is technology actually an extension of us, thereby being an extension of nature? I think he'd be appalled, actually, <laughs> by most, by a lot of what's happening with our focus on the exterior world, on gadgets, on making things happen faster, on our obsession with convenience, uh, and on the superficiality of a lot of what, we, what goes for connection and friendship you know, in the world of social media. It, it, it's very antithetical to what Emerson valued. Having said that, I think he would be impressed by the ingenuity. Uh, he had a, a huge regard for human genius and inventiveness, so I think he would appreciate it, but see the effects of it uh, and not be very happy. You know, because it's taken us out of our own, it takes us often out of our own depths and there's, it's quick, quick, quick. It's about distracting us. It also takes us away from nature. You know, I have nephews who spend all, who have spent most of their adolescence gaming in their rooms with the shades drawn, and to get them to go for a walk was absurd. I mean, it, it, it was like... Uh, Did you? Not very well, <laughs> no, no. I, I had a nephew come to visit me in New York, and he sat in front of his computer, and I said, Charles, don't you want to go for? A, don't you want to go see New York? No, no, no. You know he was ga too busy gaming with his friends. So I, I don't want to. You know I don't want to trash technology completely. Obviously, social media has its benefits. I don't think Emerson would have been uh, on Instagram. Yeah. At at some point, you say something about science being <clears throat> a kind of positivism, though. I can't, I'm sorry, I don't remember the exact moment in the book, but there's, like science can be a, a very positive. Oh, and, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Well, I, think the, I think all the advancements of the internet and blah, blah, blah are all a kind of scientific outgrowth, obviously. Yeah. Turned into commerce, turned yeah. into addiction. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Which yeah. is not so Oh, no, Emerson was fascinated by science. He was fascinated by astronomy. He was fascinated by zoology. Uh, no, he loved science. He loved science. But to him, there was no contradiction between science and spirit in the same way that he didn't see any contradiction between the personal and the transpersonal. He just didn't see divisions. So he saw science as a subset of spirituality because it's looking for the truth, which is, of course, what all philosophy is, is about anyway. So he saw, really, he saw science as a, um, as a philosophical endeavor uh, as much as just an empirical one, a materialist one. He warns against materialism as the, as, as the final word all the way through his, uh, his, his writings. You know, to be, to be stuck in secular materialism, which we are as a culture, is a dead end street. And that would have been his real sorrow, seeing the way we live now, that we've just reduced so much of what's wondrous uh, in life to, to bits and bites and fragments and particles. Yeah. An anxiety about having the newest version of whatever the bits and bytes are that everybody's buying. Right. Sherry, what were you going to ask? Oh, I, I have a, actually, yeah, at least one question. So the first one is, um, I was in conversation with a friend very recently, um, and they were navigating the question of how to resolve, how to be grateful, and how to improve one's life. And, and be progressive. And um, I'm very curious what you personally and also Emerson, how you define this, or con the confrontation of maybe, let's call it complacency. Gratitude is not complacency. Optimism is not complacency. You can be grateful for things as they are. You can practice amor fati, this loving the life that you have, and want to grow and continue to excel and want to master things. Uh, and, and, and learn and, and, and evolve. There's, there's, no, there's no contradiction between those two things. Thank you. They will appreciate hearing that. And um, there's a question over here, Sam. 
Hi, Mark. Hey, Robbie. Um, can you talk a little bit about what his practice was, your practice, you know, on, in a much more in a grounded way? Sure. Well, I'm a meditator, uh, and I've been sitting for many years. I uh, did a lot of Vipassana retreats. I've studied Buddhism uh, for many years. I'm not a card-carrying anything, though. I'm not much of a joiner. So I love the philosophy, but I'm not a, a dyed-in-the-wool uh, Buddhist. But I do practice uh, mindfulness meditation. Uh, my philosophy is non-dual. So I'm interested in non-duality wherever it comes from, whether it's Christian mysticism or Vedanta. You know, uh, Emerson himself was, was a big lover of the Gita and, and Hindu philosophy. They called him the Yankee Hindu, in fact. That's what his, his neighbors called him. Uh, he, was a, he, he was very connected to prayer, prayer and reflection. Time spent in nature was his time in church when he stopped going to church. Uh, and writing was his deep connection to, to God, to, to spirit. And that's what he practiced for, you know, for half a century when he, when he stopped, uh, when he gave up the pulpit. He lost his faith. After his wife died, uh, he lost his faith and realized he couldn't continue to give the sacraments and do what he needed to do as a minister in good faith because he didn't believe in it. Uh, so after that, he looked for his, he looked for God in all things and contemplation, reflection, writing, and prayer were really his practices. That's, that's a topic of one of your workshops, I believe. Probably, yeah. <laughs> Sign up. <laughs> Sorry? A zazen? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, for example, beginner's mind. That was a very big thing for him, what, what Suzuki Roshi talked about, beginner's mind. That was absolute, that was Emerson. You know, he talks about innocence and regain and maintaining a kind of innocence in the way that we see. Beginner's mind just talks about meeting our experience without prejudice and bias and presupposition, coming to it fresh the way you would as, as a child. Uh, and that's what he was all about. Um, it, there, Marilyn Robinson, a novelist, wrote a, a book called Gilead, and she talks about uh, an earned innocence that's as much to be sought as the innocence of children. And that earned innocence is, the, is beginner's mind. That's what, that's what um, she was referring to, and that's what Emerson was all about. And that's why he, he, he idealized children, he idealized youth as being the, the, the portal to... Uh, this kind of awakened way of being, of living. I, I understand this is not a... Um, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm just struggling how to pose this question. My question essentially is, um, given the inherent um, importance of what you are discussing, and understanding that it is not based within partisanship, nevertheless, I think this is a conversation that might be difficult to have across a partisan divide. So I would be curious to know if um, this is a conversation you have had broadly, um, and perhaps some of your strategies for having this conversation broadly. Yeah, thank you for that. These are universal principles. They're not right or left. They're not conservative or progressive. They're questions that address how it feels to be alive. How do you live? And I've had, I've ha I have had interviews with people who were right wing, left wing. I did a, a podcast with a guy. It's a, actually a big podcast for men. It's called The Art of Manliness. When it first came in, I was like, really? But The Art of Manliness, it turns out it's the largest online ma magazine for men, but it also happens to veer toward the, toward the conservative. And I was concerned. I wondered you know, how the conversation was, was going to go. And there wasn't anything I said that he couldn't connect to. We had a very deep, um, enriching conversation. I don't care if he's, I don't care about his politics. I'm not that interested in politics. I mean, these days, everything is so politicized, it's hard to not talk about it. But I have no interest in politics whatsoever. I'm not interested in things that divide people. 
And so, uh, and neither was he. So Emerson wasn't interested in that either. So what I do is pretend like it's not there. <laughs> you know, I just speak to people as people, and it's so far so good. Thank you, that was a wonderful talk. Um, here, I'm here. <laughs> um, I have lots of questions I'd like to ask you, but what comes to the foreground is, there is a phrase I read years ago which was mystics without monasteries. <coughs> mystics without monasteries. So I'm wondering, how did Emerson go forth into the world I know he was one of the founders of the Atlantic Monthly, so he must have been engaged in his day. And so I'm wondering how he combined being in the world and uh, coming from his values and his spirituality. With a lot of difficulty. Uh, Emerson was extremely introverted, a bit antisocial. He had a complex relationship with his own emotions. He once said, I have a porcupine impossibility of contact. So he saw himself as a kind of porcupine and the people could never get too close. He said, sometimes I look at the people in my own house as if uh, across a gulf. So he was profoundly alienated. He had grown up as an awkward, very shy, moody, sickly little boy. Nobody expected much from him. Uh, and so it didn't come naturally to him. You're asking how he moved through the world with some difficulty. Uh, he didn't, he wasn't, he, he wasn't um, a glad hander. He didn't have an easy time. He hated small talk. I mean, he just was apparently incapable of small talk. So social situations were agonizing for him. Uh, and I think he was most comfortable when he was teaching or, or when he was lecturing, when he gave up the, uh, his, you know, when he gave up his pulpit, he became a speaker on the Lyceum Circuit, which was the public speaking circuit of his day for seekers, basically. And he was comfortable when he was on stage, holding forth, speaking to humanity. Uh, talking to men and women wasn't always as easy for him. Absolutely. Oh yes. Oh yes. Oh yes. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Yeah. He was. A, he was an ardent anti um, anti slavery. A speaker, and when the fugitive slave law came along, when the Northerners were made to return slaves uh, who had who had run away, he gave a, a fiery uh, lecture against that. So no, he had very strong uh, social stands, but he wasn't he wasn't right or left. It wasn't about right or left. It was about more like, more about what feeds uh, the truth of. Human, you know, being a full human being, and what helps other people uh, live into their, uh, you know, live into their um, potential, and what doesn't. That, that, that was really the question for him. Thanks. Thanks. Um, I can go ahead and talk to my kid. Okay. Um, I, you obviously are working on a very spiritual, really enviable plane that would be to be in your local astrology. No. <laughs> you, you, I, you know, you, you, you've done a lot of work on this, and you're, you know, you seem very enlightened. And um, I was just wondering how you feel about it at this point. I'm not looking forward to it. But when I've really lived with a, 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 the proximity of mortality for most of my life. And so it, it's so much a part of the way I see and the way I live. I think I'm more comfortable with it probably than. You're not, you're, you talk about you're not, you try or you are not very separate from nature as you try to be part of. So here you are, an individual who could possibly die at an older age or whatever. So how do you feel about that? Now? You're not great, huh? <laughs> no, I feel fine about it. I, yeah, I don't. I'm not. I, I feel fine about it. It's the terms. It's the terms and the conditions of this experience. 
there's this is this is part of how I survived going through a, a, a lot of a years of, of hard time was not arg not fighting with reality, learning to not argue so much with things as they are, because I saw that that just increased my my pain and my anxiety. In Buddhism, Buddhism they talk about the second arrow. You know, there's pain, which is the first arrow, and then the second arrow is, this shouldn't be happening, I hate this, you know, why me, and all. That's how pain becomes suffering. So I've spent a lot of years trying to feel pain without turning it into suffering with some kind of story about uh, why, you know, why me? Why not me? You know, I, 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 that, the, the good thing about getting a diagnosis is it, it, it humbles you. And you start, you know, the whole sort of illusion of immortality or the specialness or why, you know, it's never going to happen to me just completely falls away. And that's a good thing. It gives you a lot more empathy for other people. I also hate that, that people try to figure out why you got sick. Oh. What did you do wrong that now you have, you know, fill in the blank? It is such a stupid way of looking at things. And I think that part of it is that we feel like in this culture, if we stay young, if we look young, if we you know, pull the wool over everybody's eyes, that, that somehow or another that's an achievement. And if you don't do that, you've failed. So if you get sick, you've failed. And we, we don't have, death is so unpresent in this culture. You read about it, you read about mass shootings, but it's all kind of blurred into a generalized sense of damage and loss rather than understanding that corporality and if then of course this is what you get from nature like in huge amounts it's like the seasons <laughs> for instance I mean there's just so many evidences of it and I also think it has to be somebody else's turn at some point you just can't keep going right you know right. Have, give somebody else a turn right. hi with so much um, connection and wisdom from nature, did Emerson talk about and feel into cooperation from the nature world? And can you share a little oh, bit? Has, there's such beautiful writing about this <laughs> that, that if we realize that we sit in the lap, he said, we, li we, live in the, we sit in the lap of a great intelligence. And if we realize that we're in the lap of this intelligence, uh, and just and started to listen mm -hmm. to what we were being taught. He said that nature is our greatest teacher. So learning from nature about adaptation, about perseverance, about resilience, about adversity, about, about generativity, about you know, nature is always you know, returning. You know, and if we take those qualities as life lessons, uh, we tap into our own deep intelligence. And 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 did he tap into the subtle energetic fields? He doesn't talk about them as such, but he, if you read certain sections of Emerson, when he talks about so one day he was walking across Boston Common, it had been raining, uh, and there, there, there was wet on the ground, and he saw sort of a, 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 the sky reflected, and he said, I become a transparent eyeball. <laughs> you know, it's one of his most famous passages. I become a transparent eyeball. That's pure mysticism. So, so he talks about it, but not in, in, that, uh, in that language. Thanks. I was just going to say to your question about death, I started reading Emerson when my grandmother had brain cancer, mm -hmm. and my whole life totally changed after mm -hmm. I read Emerson. Mm -hmm. um, it became a whole new way of looking at the world, mm -hmm. and... Um, I'm now like not afraid to die, which sounds really weird, but when you start to realize that you are part of everything and you're all connected and it's you have access to like we're all we're all one. You know, it's amazing. So it really totally changed my life. It's great. Happy to hear that. Um, wonderful talk, thank you. And uh, some of the comments that you've made and audience members makes me wonder, did Emerson believe in an afterlife? No, he did not. He didn't talk about it. I don't know what he believed. Uh, he, I mean, he was, as I said, he, he was a, a fan of the Gita. 
and he was certainly a b great believer in karma. He said a weak man believes in, um, oh, I forgot it, but anyway, he, the, the upside is that a strong man believes in cause and effect. So he was very much uh, behind the, the philosophy of karma, but he doesn't talk about reincarnation. He, he, he makes some references to, um, to rebirth, to a possible you know, future, but he, he doesn't uh, come down one way or the other on, on that. Thank you. Sure. Brahman. Yes. Do you know that Brahman. poem? It's so beautiful. Yes. And I was just thinking when he was at Harvard, he had studied Hinduism is so much larger than denominations. It was like he he did the instead of all the spokes leading to God, he almost did the rim of the great wheel, you mm. know, in his reading. Mm. And um, uh, I think I think we all could use it, and you 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 articulated it so well. So thank you. Sure, my pleasure. Yeah. Coming, don't worry. Thank you very much for being here. This has sure. been wonderful. I'm actually a Quaker, and the aura of, of so much of the discussion is um, uh, reminiscent of some of my my faith and opportunity as a Quaker mm. uh, to embrace those uh, ideas. Did Emerson have any friends or acquaintances who were Quakers? A lot. Yes, he did. It was close. It was close to his heart. You know, the idea of there being a light that we're all sharing, that the light within, uh, the idea of testifying, giving testimony, uh, without outside of hierarchy, was very close to him. Yeah, no, Quakerism was, was something that, that Emerson, Emerson loved, yes. Thank you. Hi. Um, you're speaking that in this day and age with all populations across the world, nations, ages, et cetera, races, questioning the stories that we have been living with and been told for ever, uh, creating much stress. Uh, and, and, and it was the need for the time for this book. Uh, as you look out over the crowd and notice that we're all of a certain age, um, and you speak of the Ram Dass saying that it's, it's wisdom that continues on and continues to grow. It's the only thing. A mm. couple of questions about what has your action in life been? What was Emerson's action in life? Um, you mentioned your nephews, I think. They would rather game than go out. How, how, we have an affinity for what you're talking about, us that are sitting here. Um, how do we share that or uh, make our 40 year old children <laughs> uh, uh, even aware of it. <laughs> okay. yeah. Speak up for those of us who are not the boomer generation. We're not invisible. Well, we, we have, you know, X's, Y's, Z's, ones. Yeah. yeah. There's only one way, which is to be it. You have to be it be the change. You have to be the awareness that you want to communicate to them. You know, people don't learn by being told what they're doing wrong. They don't learn by, you know, through, you know, through concepts and ideas. They learn through example. We learn through imitation. Uh, and so working on ourselves. So when I would find myself, you know, raging at my nephew for not wanting to leave the house, <laughs> instead of raging at him, I sat with my rage. So look at this, look at this. I'm absolutely, I want to throttle him. How can, and then how do I do that to myself? <laughs> you know, and how do I do that to other people? And how does that rage, you know, run as a current turn through my life? And the more you explore that, the less you're, the less focused I am on fixing my nephew, who I couldn't fix anyway. They don't listen to anything you say. So I've learned, I learned to say less and just try to be more, present with him and listen 
ask questions, uh, and try not to be too attached to getting any kind of a response. Thank you so much. And I'm not sure that I have a question, but more of a comment. Um, I was brought up very religious and Lutheran. My parents were involved with the church, yada, yada. And I would go there and just feel so guilty and such a hypocrite and look around and you know, not really understand or believe. And when I finally got my license, I drove to the beach. And that's where, quote, I found God. It was not in the philosophy. It was not the thinking about it. But it was being in the experience of nature. And not so much, like now I take pictures a lot. And I went on a retreat with a friend to the Grand Canyon. And she was like, stop taking pictures. Just be present in nature. And I think that nature is a very neutral language. Water is water. You know, it can show up as rain or the tsunami or the lake. But water itself is just neutral. And I think if we get to that part of nature and God being neutral and allow us to be embraced by the essence of, it's not so much a thought. I think we try to philosophize, and I think religion is, is a philosophy, and we try to get this essence into a thought. I don't think it's possible. So one of the reasons living out here is like we are embraced by such beauty and such nature. And I don't know how many of us really take the time to just be in nature, to be part of it, and to be embraced by it. I'm looking forward to reading your book. Thank you so much. Last question. Sorry, last question. Yeah, I, I think let's not confuse the internet for the growing awareness by many people younger than me uh, about the planet and where their rage is and where their focus is. I mean, there is this uh, kind of lost um, electronic people <laughs> that do exist, but their peers are also very aware of the planet. Yes. And there is a connectedness that comes with the internet, for example, mm -hmm. that is also connecting them about the planet. Mm -hmm. And that is a, a growing source. And I, I have a favorite quote that it's in one of uh, Joseph Goldstein's talks when he's uh, t uh, talking about w when the Buddha was asked, what's the cause of death? And the Buddha answered, birth. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Robbie. Thank you, Robbie. Thank you, Mark Matusik. Thank you. And thank, thank you, you April Gornick, for such a wonderful, enlightening talk tonight. Thank you both so very much.